This is the Balanced Advisor Podcast with Dr. Travis Perry, helping financial advisors like you achieve balance in their lives. All right, welcome everyone to the Balanced Advisor Podcast. I have with me Mr. Lee Baker, and he's the founder and president of Apex Financial Services. He spent the last two decades working to help clients create and achieve the vision for their life. His biggest joy is his wife and his daughters, and we actually got connected because it found that Lee was on that Investopedia Top 100 Advisors. So congratulations, Lee, for that great achievement, and welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Uh, happy to be here with you, Travis. Absolutely. I love having great guests who have made you know incredible business or personal um, goals and that they've set. Uh, was it was it a goal of yours to to get on Investopedia's you know list? Did you did, did you try for that for a while? Know about it? What what was kind of the idea there? I I absolutely did not try. Um, you know I'm honored to have made the list, but there was no effort or attempt on my part to to get onto the list. Uh, I've been motivated simply by trying to improve things for people, and and so uh, being involved in different organizations, you know doing a good job for my clients primarily, uh, but there was never an effort to, to be on any list. And so if it was being involved in the Financial Planning Association or serving as president of AARP here in Georgia, it's all about helping people and not, you know, an attempt or a grand scheme to end up on anybody's list. So Yeah, well, you, you got there anyway. I mean, that's wonderful that, that they found you. Uh, and I know that's a, it's a pretty complicated, you know, algorithm they've got of, of finding those individuals. And so what, a, what an honor to be speaking with you. You're in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we talked briefly about how you made it into the industry. Um, like myself, kind of stumbled into the, into the industry. Maybe bring us up to date on, you know, the quick story behind how you found financial planning, how you got it. Yeah. You know, so the way that I found financial planning was was quite by accident. You know, uh, I came here to Atlanta, go to school, went to Georgia Tech, go Jackets. Uh, but my freshman year, my dad got sick. And so, candidly, I'm the result of you know, what I might call, you know, some unfortunate mishaps, if you will, and, and, and at times feel like Forrest Gump. But, you know, from an upbringing standpoint, um, middle class, lower middle class, and my dad got sick. He was diagnosed with cancer, uh, probably within a couple of months of me uh, getting on campus. And uh, like any college kid, the, what little money I had from scholarships and that sort of thing, I, I made a couple of mistakes and then found myself in need of uh, some money, but there was no money to call home and ask for, right? And so uh, found a part-time job. That job turned out to have been with uh, an insurance agency. Uh, Lindemann Insurance that focused primarily on employee benefits with small employers. And so uh, that's how things got started. Um, you know, I'd, I'd say the biggest impetus after that probably came a year or two later. Um, you know, my wife and I started dating uh, my senior year in high school, and, and we're still together today. Uh, and, and she likes me most of the time. So, uh, but um, unfortunately, about a year or so later, uh, in, in October, her father passed away and her mother had passed away when she was a little girl. Um, and so at that point, you know, you know, she's 19 years old and has a younger sister in high school and a little brother in junior high school. And uh, over the course of trying to help her with some things, uh, found a situation where uh, not through malfeasance, somebody just gave her some bad advice and they didn't know what they were doing. And I had happened to have learned enough to know, hey, listen, that's that's not right. And it, it saved them a, a pretty significant portion of uh, the life insurance and inheritance that they were getting from their father, uh, which is incredibly important when all of a sudden you find, uh, you know, kids uh, who are effectively on their own. You know, you got grandma and that sort of thing that love them and want to help them. But uh, in, in many ways, my then girlfriend, now wife was probably my first financial planning client. Pro bono, of course. I love it. Not only are you humble and you make it to this coveted list, but you know, the very first person that you really helped as a financial planning was pro bono. And she, you know, apparently loved you enough to say, yes, I love you. <laughs> you guys are great. What a, what a power couple there. I, lo I love that um, explanation. And, and you, you sound like you enjoy doing this. You love, you know, the advice aspect 
Uh, and so that propelled you forward. Now you own your own practice and you have a team, uh, a firm there in Atlanta that, uh, you know, is making a great difference. So what, a, what an incredible story. Thanks for sharing that, Lee. As you've been doing this, um, as you built your business, as, as you've been, you know, going from, you know, insurance agency to owning your own company and practice, what would you say through all of this is your definition of work-life balance? Like, what does that look like? If you had to paint a picture for someone else, you're saying, this is what work-life balance has been um, for me, whether or not you've achieved it, but what is that looking like? You know, I'd say for me, work-life balance is is multifaceted. And and I'd like to perhaps divide it into three buckets, right? And say that I've achieved some level of success in these three buckets. Uh, One of the buckets is clearly business. You know, I've got a, an actual business uh, that operates, uh, it, you know, it has good margins and uh, there's some ability for that business to live beyond me. Um, another bucket or facet, uh, if you will, is family. You know, my family is the most important thing to me. And if you know, my wife and the girls aren't happy, I'm not happy. And, uh, you know, I'll drop everything else to try to correct that situation uh, if it needs correcting. And so uh, that's incredibly important to me. Uh, The third bucket, if you will, uh, still goes back to, you know, the way I was raised with my mom and dad. And that's sort of this giving idea. You know, my father, uh, who was a minister, would often say, you don't get to just come to church and, and sit in the pews. Uh, you have to be involved. You have to be engaged. Now, everybody uh, isn't meant to be uh, real close to the microphone when it's time to sing a song. Um, everybody's not cut out to deliver a sermon, but there's something you can do. And so there's always that aspect of giving back. And so for me, even from a professional standpoint, uh, when I, I made the decision to go into financial planning, uh, getting involved in the organization and the industry was something that you're just supposed to do. And so at the time you had the IAFP, ICFP, and now FBA. And so I, I got involved and, uh, you know, raise my hand and say, hey, listen, yeah, I'm willing to do that. And so if I have a, a, a picture of what work-life balance looks like now, it's the ability to have those three buckets working well. Um, now, that being said, sometimes you got to do some flexing. Um, and sometimes I've got to be smart enough to say, hey, listen, I'd love to help you out with that particular thing, but I can't right now. Um, Or, uh, you know, I've got things on my business calendar, then maybe, you know, if it's AARP or Clark Atlanta or my church, there's times when I just have to say, you know, um, I'd love to, but I can't make that meeting. Um, You know, I can't make that conference call. and I'd love to do it, but I just can't because I've got to make those decisions about, uh, prioritizing those things. And um, specifically on the family front, you know, I, I think something that a lot of business owners can struggle with, I believe, and, and I'll admit that I've had my own struggles, is really being present um, when you're with your family. It, it's one thing to, to physically uh, be there, but in, in many ways, it, it kind of reminds me of this uh, R&B song from when I was a kid, uh, I think the words are something to the effect of your, your body's here with me, but your mind is on the other side of town. And uh, so uh, instead of being in that situation, uh, I'm trying to make sure that my body is there with my, my wife and children and my mind and attention is there at the same time and prevent uh, that, that wandering around that can happen from time to time. Oh, great. I love that. Even managed to fit in an R&B song. I love it. Now I'm going to have to find it. You're going to have to show it and share that with me, Lee. Uh, there we go. <laughs> you might have to have that on the podcast at the very end. Um, but I, I love that idea. Being present is so um, talked about uh, mm-hmm. from good relationship advice, giving to productivity, uh, work-life balance. We've discussed this all the time. Uh, and I think what it is, is this, it's the technology, right? It's, it's the technology now allows us to perceive that we can be in multiple places at once. And the brain, if we don't turn that off, when we come home, it's still working. 
It's still working. Absolutely. We discussed in the pre-show about um, a little bit about being on vacation and some of those struggles, right, of being present on a vacation. Who doesn't live to put your toes in the sand? But if your toes are in the sand and your mind is in your business, are you truly there? <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. The parable yeah. of the day. Absolutely. You know, that I, that reminds me of a, a vacation that we took some years ago. And there had been a stretch for whatever the reasons are where we've not really gone on an extended vacation. You know, you may be you do those long weekend kind of things. You leave on Thursday or maybe Friday and you go somewhere for a couple of days. You come on back and you're right in the office. But um, uh, myself, my wife and some of our extended family, you know, we rented a cabin up in the mountains of Tennessee. And uh, I'll never forget the feeling I had uh, that was caused by two things. One was simply poor internet reception. Uh, because of how high up we were, there just wasn't, there wasn't any reception. And, and, and so it helped force uh, me to kind of be away from some things. But I, um, I woke up earlier than everybody else. And, you know, again, I, even today, I still get up fairly early in the morning. Uh, but put on a cup of coffee, tried not to wake people up and walked out on the deck and just kind of uh, sat there on the deck, overlooking trees and trees and more trees. And because of how high up we were literally in the clouds, it was just incredibly peaceful and relaxing uh, to sit on a deck in the mountains, in the clouds with trees and hearing nothing. Um, and, and so uh, I thought, you know, we got to make sure that we find these kind of moments a lot more often. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. I mean, it's that when you're done with that sort of vacation and you can have that present attitude and being there, right? It It's totally different because then that creates that brain that is able to say, yeah, that was amazing. And I want to do it again. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you feel different, you know, um, you know, I know I've been there and I've heard people talk about it where you go on vacation, but heck you come back from vacation and you're more tired than you were when you went. And I think that's a combination of one trying to cram a lot into it. But I also think there's an element of, really not being on vacation. And, you know, I'm not uh, a linguist by by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I kind of make up in my mind that part of being on vacation is vacating some of the other stuff uh, that you should leave behind, wherever behind is, and allow your, yourself the, the time, your brain the time uh, to, you know, relax, you know, get quiet, um, kind of do nothing. And the same thing for your body, uh, because if we don't shut it off some, you know, I think eventually um, our body starts telling on us. I think you're right. I think it's that idea of shutting it off and being able to, you know, have those, those boundaries that are psychological, they're present, they're physical. So literally going on vacation, being in the trees, you're not in the four by four office, right? No. You're in a different area. Uh, my wife and I finished a vacation in Mexico. I was talking about in the pre-show. And when I'm cruising through the jungles on a zip line, I'm not thinking about business. <laughs> you know, exactly. my mind is like, this is awesome. I'm going to be adventurous. When I am snorkeling around looking at um, some, you know, amazing fish or coral or, you know, barracuda here and there, like I, and, and put, you know, playing with dolphins, I'm not thinking about business. You know, normally I'll do short getaways. I have my bike rides. I run, uh, you know, occasionally um, when I work out. And in those times, I'm okay. I'm okay with having that time being time where my mental, you know, capacity can work outside of the four walls. Um, but when I'm on the longer vacations, like we benefit a lot from having that, you know, time away. So Absolutely. I appreciate you bringing that up. You know, you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, work-life balance is having, you know, these three buckets, which I really like the business, the family giving back. Um, and which is interestingly enough, one of the reasons why you're on the top 100 is because you're giving back You're you're part of the community. Um, what do you think is something that you really struggle with keeping those three at the top? Um, 
you know, I, I think the way my brain is wired, um, and, and I think things worked out well in terms of me going to Georgia Tech and, and getting a degree in engineering. One of the problems with that is uh, I'm really, really curious about stuff. And I can sometimes get, I can go down into the rabbit hole, right? And, um, you know, that's a, that's a two-edged sword, right? And, and so I have to make sure that I kind of check myself to make sure that I don't get those distractions and then really refocus on what's important um, and make sure that, you know, make sure that I'm spending the time on what's really important. And, and again, I, I'll be a bit of an open book. I haven't always done a good job at that. Um, I, I, I'm doing better um, at making sure that I'm, I'm focusing on what needs to be focused on uh, so that I can be better in those areas um, and get comfortable with the fact that even though I think about three things in terms of three buckets, those buckets are not 33, 33, 33. You know, um, there may be times where, um, you know, hey, it, it could be 50, 25, 25 or, or whatever the case might be. And, and, you know, 2020 more than anything showed the need uh, to, to, to do those things. And so, you know, for me, candidly, one of the things that um, has become really important to me again, in just a happenstance of, of COVID, um, my wife and I figured out how much we really like just walking together, you know, um, since she no longer had a commute. Um, I wasn't commuting and we're kind of like, look, we're not going out for a while. Uh, not going to just stay in the house. Let's get out. You know, let's walk. Let's walk up to the lake in our neighborhood and, and take some laps around the lake and, you know, see the deer because we're getting up early in the morning, you know, it's six o'clock in the morning. And so you, you see the, the deer or the falcon or the eagle and, you know, turtles and that sort of thing. Um, and you get a chance to talk, you know, you're out in nature. Um, and, you know, I think movement is important. Uh, but, you know, we get a chance to, to talk to each other about whatever, you know, um, and, and there's no concern that, hey, listen, maybe we can't talk about this right now because the girls may be awake or the girls might hear something um, or whatever. I mean, sometimes it's like, wow, look at the, the coloring of the sky. And it's pretty cool to just enjoy that time with each other. And so, um, yeah, we want to exercise, but there's a. I don't know, emotional benefit to just kind of going, <laughs> walking together and, and, and talking about stuff. And, and so that's been an unintended upside. Uh, but uh, again, for me, it's, it's been learning to, you know, be more intentional and, and focused on those different elements. And so that, that's been an unintended positive coming out of COVID. Wonderful. I appreciate you sharing. My wife and I uh, have, have actually used our, our, uh, we have a pretty long uh, neighborhood drive right here. We have all on about one acre lots and mm -hmm. pretty spread out homes. But we use this, you know, probably two mile walk to just walk down and, and back. And uh, a couple times a day, we've made that a, just a tradition. And it started because of COVID. So very yeah. interesting. You know, that's happened with you guys just naturally. Uh, what a wonderful thing as you're trying to keep that balance, to have that connection, right? Absolutely. Uh, great, great idea. Well, as an advisor, you, uh, you know, you're running a business, you're taking your practice to this business level, you are um, seeing a lot of other advisors out there in the community, you've served, you've been giving back um, in, into the industry. So you probably well know some of the other things that advisors struggle with on a regular basis to keep balance. Um, what do you think are some of those you know, the biggest issues that other advisors face trying to find work-life balance? You know, I, I think for a lot of people, and, and I'll include myself, and, and there are some, some folk that, that come to my mind, uh, you know, there's some people I think of that are literally always on, right? And, um, you know, I, I think that's just the way they are. You know, I've met some people one uh, person, he's not an advisor, but in a, a related industry. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget, uh, he had been, you know, I like to describe it as big game hunting, 
you know, there's this really, really massive client and, and he'd been working, he's working really, really hard uh, to, to land this particular account. And after years, he got it. And I'll, I'll never forget, he, he picked up the phone, he was on the golf course um, and uh, he was playing with a, another prospective client, much smaller client <laughs> by a, there, there was some movement in the decimal points in terms of the, the revenue it would generate. Um, and he was like, Hey, listen, I got fill in the blank, really, really huge client. Uh, and then he, he, he immediately pivoted and said, Hey, listen, um, I'll, I'll call you back later. Uh, I'm playing golf with this, you know, physician, uh, that, that's got seven employees and, you know, just the, the scope of magnitude, um, you're talking about in, in one case, you, you landed something that instantly meant you're a millionaire, um, but you couldn't turn it off. And your focus was, I got to get this next one. Um, and so I, I think that kind of a thing happens to a lot of us where you simply can't turn it off. And perhaps it's because your uh, mindset is, hey, listen, um, my my sense of being, my sense of worth is in being the top producer or, you know, back back when there were more regularly these kind of conferences or, or whatever, if uh, you were in more of a production type environment, uh, just that sense of like, no, I've got to I've got to be there. And it's a different focus. And, and I'm not saying that's a bad focus, but it can be problematic. Um, you know, I, I think another thing uh, that uh, can be a problem for advisors and myself, candidly, you know, hey, listen, I've never been diagnosed, but I think I've got a little bit of ADHD. And, and so we wander and lose focus and tend to get busy. And so there are little things that I've learned through the years that have been helpful for me. Um, candidly, a simple, uh, a simple thing like minimizing the uh, outlook window. Uh, because I know that an email comes up and I see it pop up on the screen. All of a sudden, I've, I've, I'm distracted and I'm looking at that email and I've lost it temporarily. And, and so uh, I think that's a, another kind of thing. You know, I you think of another friend of mine and I say this lovingly and have said it lovingly to him and about him in public. He's kind of like the, the dog from the cartoon movie Up where, uh, you know, the, you know, it's just squirrel and, and something comes by your attention is grabbed and you're off to the next thing. And that hampers us from getting done that important thing at that point in time. And so uh, between maybe having a little too intense of a focus on quote unquote production, or I want to be at the top um, and uh, managing a little bit of the attention deficit disorder, I, I think from my own personal experience and those of a few people that I'm, I'm, I'm close to, I think those are two big ones. Yeah, I think you nailed some really important points. And, you know, I've uh, studied and helped other advisors with what you just mentioned, this first issue of mindset, um, where they just can't turn it off. They can't create these boundaries to turn it off. And some of it actually is, is, be, is because and it might actually be the why they come to the industry, what drives them to the industry mm -hmm. is this fascination with finances, with money, with managing it for others, but this fascination to understand it themselves. Um, a lot of salespeople do really well in the industry. And if they can figure out how to be an advisor, <laughs> can be a great advisor and planner, right? Um, right. You know, and, and nothing against anyone. I'm not a, sure. you know, advisor only, insurance only. There's places for everybody in this industry. Exactly. And my audience, you know, I have some from, from every aspect. But I think that, that that sales mentality does really well in a, you know, insurance sales, bank sales, right? Because that, that's the focus. But like you mentioned, you've got a friend who can't turn it off as he's landed this million dollar deal. And he's going probably, it sounded like this, you know, a smaller client, maybe, maybe not, but, um, you know, he's, regardless, he's, he's still on the hunt, like can't slow down. Exactly. That's what he's getting to. And it, this financial psychology looks at that and says, is that because of our ego? Is that because 
our self-esteem depends on continual, ever daily present sales. And if you've trained yourself to be a salesperson um, and then the sales are, you know, have gone away or whatever, it's almost that dopamine that gets hit to the brain when your notifications go off that you just mentioned um, to, because you're important. So I think there's a little bit of that. Um, would you agree with that, Lee? Would you, you know, absolutely. Do you think that there's some ego yeah. and self-esteem issues there? I absolutely think there's some of that. Uh, you know, I, I played sports all my life until I got to, to college and, you know, realized, Hey, here's the difference between, you know, division one college athletes and, and, and me. Um, but in many ways, it's like being an athlete, you know, when you run out on the field, and you make that big tackle or you score the touchdown. Um, candidly, I'll say for me, there's that that feeling of, yeah, I did it. But there's also that feeling of knowing that, you know, even in high, if you're in a big high school, you've got thousands of people cheering for you. And if you make it uh, professionally and collegiately, if you can just imagine this idea of you're running out on the field and, and, and we saw, you know, Tom Brady dash somebody else's hopes again uh, here a couple of days ago. Um, <laughs> But, you know, as you're running out onto the field, the adrenaline that goes with that, it is not at all surprising that a lot of athletes struggle when that goes away, right? And, and so we're looking at a career, um, even though uh, Tom Brady's had an extended career, but on average, you're talking about something only lasts about three and a half years. And so that, you know, to replace that feeling, it's a difficult thing to do. And so I, I think with uh, you know, a, a again, and, and again, this is no disrespect to sales because candidly, we all sell. Um, but as it relates to that, that compensation, and if there's a training mo module or method that says, hey, listen, I've got to do this, I got to do this, I've got to make the sale, I got to make the sale, there can be, and again, this is above my pay grade, but I can easily see where that, uh, that, that dopamine rush is, is tied to it. Um, and, and so that makes perfectly good sense to me. Yeah. And I think, you know, relating this back to sports where a lot of people come from and had success, high school, college. Uh, when I have these kinds of conversations with other clients of mine, it, a lot of times it does come back to some of that um, competition and they bring it uh, to, to business. And so I, I get it. Well, I mean, this has been a great conversation. Um, you know, and to kind of wrap this up, if if you could say this has been the one thing that's helped you stay focused, stay present, you've kind of mentioned, you know, killing some of those notifications on your outlook. So you're not getting that those notification buzzes. Um, right. What else would you suggest, you know, to the industry, to people who are maybe even in your shoes or wanting to be in your shoes uh, with with the business that's running well, trying to have those three buckets being good? What, what would you say is kind of some advice? You know, uh, this, this, this may sound crazy, uh, but talking to myself, um, I, I find that I spend more time talking to myself and, and not necessarily audibly uh, so that people walk in and kind of go, oh, righty, you know, Lee has uh, Lee slipped over there. But really having conversations with myself where uh, I'm, I'm thinking through, hey, listen, what do I want to have happen today? You know, what do I want to have happen next week? Uh, and again, to go back to, uh, you know, talking about sports, um, in spite of having had background in sports, from a business perspective, I didn't always use some of the tools or things that I learned in sports, right? And, and so, um, you know, if it's, if it's throwing a ball, running a ball, hitting a ball, whatever the case might be, at a point, you don't think about it anymore. Um, but you can visualize what it is that needs to happen. And then it becomes a little bit automatic. And so uh, I have learned to spend more time basically talking to myself and uh, thinking about visualizing, hey, listen, this is kind of what I need to achieve today. This is what you know, I want to happen over the course of the next week or, or the next six months or year. And it, it's one thing to write it down on a piece of paper or digitally, whatever the case might be. But I, I think for me, it's been really helpful to begin that process of having those conversations uh, with myself, uh, expanding it, 
particularly to, to my wife. And, and I try to, um, I try to watch that balance where, you know, for my wife, and I've told her this many times, although sometimes I'm not so sure she believes it. If there's any one person that I trust, it's her. Um, and, and I mean, trust implicitly. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm always going to go with her opinion, but there's many times where it's like, hey, babe, is it okay if I ask you this question and it's, it's business related, you know, what I want to do. And so expanding that and saying, hey, listen, here's what I'm thinking. Um, does that make sense to you? Is there something that I'm missing? Uh, but then finding that time, uh, making an effort to find the quiet time to really think about it and explore some things. I mean, I've had my own mental blocks and I've shared it with you. Uh, personally, if anything, uh, I, I, in my life from a business perspective, should have spent more time being like some of my friends and, and, and I will crack these jokes and make a phone call and say, hey, listen, I turned on my inner Paulie. You'd love what I did. Um, but I didn't do it enough. And, and, and so, you know, a few people have kind of given me that kick in the pants to make sure that I do a better job of that. But even then, that's a function of saying, hey, listen, are you really doing what you should do in order to be helpful to more people? I love it. I love it. Thank you. Great advice. Uh, what I hear from you for, from this, you know, whole interview is the constant interaction with your wife, depending on her, uh, trusting her implicitly, making that effort to find the time. It's, it's really a lot of what I, I teach in the book, Achieving Balance is the make time method. We all have the same amount of time. Are we making time for those things that are highest priority? But you hit actually on the third myth of, of the book, um, huh. which is which is actually chapter 80 or chapter nine, 83, page 83 ish, uh, chapter nine. And that, that's this idea that, you know, we're, we're not an island. We don't develop alone, at least not very far, that yeah. we need our spouse. We need our family to help keep us balanced. So I, I really appreciate you making that point and driving that home very well, Lee. Thanks for, for the interview today. Thank you for making time to be with us. I know you're busy. And so we, we, we gratefully uh, thank you for, for being here. And thanks, everybody, for, for listening to this conversation today. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Enjoy being here with you. Thank you, sir.